So hey everybody, Peter Maravellis here. I hope this finds you all safe and well. On behalf of City Lights, I'd like to welcome you to City Lights Live, our virtual reading series that continues in the footsteps of our in-store calendar during the shelter in place. We continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums throughout the fall season and into the winter. I'd like to take a moment to remind you all, City Lights has reopened its doors to the public. Following San Francisco Health Department guidelines, we aim to make your visit to City Lights as safe as possible. So please do come on down, visit us. Uh, you'll be able to once again, browse our stacks. Our business hours are seven days a week from 12 noon until 8 p.m. We've actually worked very, very hard to transform the store for the age of COVID. The entrance is now on the Broadway side of the building. It's at 271 Columbus. And the original entrance is now an exit only. So we encourage everyone, please, please, please do wear facial covering while visiting. We're trying to make all our efforts to keep things as safe as possible for everybody. So as many of you know, City Lights is a publishing house as well as a bookstore. We continue to publish in the grand tradition of Lawrence Ferlinghetti's seminal Pocket Poet series. Uh, and we continue to produce on a seasonal basis, new books of poetry, fiction, literature and translation, and nonfiction informed by a progressive political outlook. Uh, we have new titles out from David Barsamian, from Stan Cox, also a very timely book by Alan Hirsch about our current electoral crisis. Also a new book out from the 21st Poet Laureate of the United States, Juan Felipe Herrera, as well as new poetry from Uchi Naduka and Sophia Dahlin. So to learn more about the books that we publish, as well as all of our up and coming events, please do visit us on our website at www.citylights.com. And you can also uh, keep up on our activities via social media. We have a presence on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, you name it. Uh, you can also subscribe to our newsletter and get weekly updates about our new books and also all up and coming events. Uh, also, I'd like to remind you all, um, our neighbor Vesuvio Cafe is also now open for business. Uh, they've set up chairs in Kerouac Alley, so please come on down, grab a beer and a book. So tonight, we are thrilled to be hosting an event for the fabulous Omnidon Press, featuring new books from Ma Xian Wen and Natalie Kankan. Omnidon is an award-winning local Bay Area independent press and a 501c whose goal is to support and expand the local community of writers, uh, but also, you know, national as well. I mean, they publish really wonderful books from fabulous fiction to poetry, really always with an eye towards questioning both in form and content, kind of the prevailing limits of convention. So the two new books we're celebrating tonight are a Storage Unit for the Spirit House by Mashi and Wynn and Quiet Orient Riot by Natalie Kankan. Um, they will be joined tonight by Sue Huang and by Marcella Hernandez Castillo. So uh, I have to say, before we get started, uh, we've hosted events with Omnidon before in the past. Rusty Morrison and Ken Keegan, the publishers of Omnidon have always been incredibly generous and uh, actually catered these events with food and drink. So due to the constraints of the virtual life, we'll be missing out on this aspect of the event, but uh, I would like to take a moment and really thank them for their past generosity and support of City Lights and really also everything they do as a publisher and supporter of the literary life. Uh, please, if you get a chance, do check out their website. Uh, it's at uh, www.omnidon.com. Um, you can purchase all of their books here. And of course, uh, you can buy these books here at City Lights. In fact, we're gonna be posting links in the chat function of your dashboard uh, with which you can purchase books. So first up is Su Huang. Su Huang is a recipient of the inaugural Jerome Hill Fellowship in Literature, the Academy of American Poets James Wright Prize, and a Writers in Residence Fellowships to Dickinson House, as well as Hedgebrook, among others. Uh, her debut poetry collection, Bodega, published with Milkweed Editions, won the 2020 Minnesota Awards in Poetry. Uh, she teaches with the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop and is the co-founder of Poetry Asylum with Sun Young Shin. Uh, she currently makes her home in South Minneapolis. Thank you so much for, for bearing the time change, Sue. It's, it's really a great pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Yes? Yeah, we thank can hear you. you. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you to everyone at City Lights. Uh, I was a longtime resident of San Francisco, um, so I say, I mean, I grew up in New York, but I, I say I found myself in San Francisco. So I definitely left my heart there. And it's such an honor to be here with all of you tonight and like 
soaking in the West Coast vibes, you know, California, woo! Um, um, it's snowing here in Minneapolis right now, so that's fucked. Uh, but we got eight inches on October 20th, so like it's crazy. Um, so it's all good. Um, anyway, I'm just so excited to be here and I'm so honored and thrilled to read with all the amazing poets tonight. Um, Otello, as I, 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 we've already talked about how we met. And, uh, you don't remember me, but I remember you from AW, uh, AWP 2017. Um, and Natalie, congratulations on, on, your, on your book launch. Like how exciting and wonderful. I can't wait to read your book. And Ma, I'm so, so thrilled to see you tonight. Um, we read together a year ago in San Francisco. Um, and I'm just like so happy to be, be able to share this time with you uh, through time and space and through the ether. So, um, and I think we're all just feeling really relieved, right? And like feeling like we can exhale for the first time in a long time. Um, but I also think that, you know, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. You know, 71 million people voted for Trump and eight, he had 8 million more voters this time around than 2016. So I don't think we can get too comfortable in our, in our relief and joy, but I don't wanna be a total buzzkill. So <laughs> um, I'll just start reading some poetry. Um, I'm gonna actually start with a poem from Ma's first book. Um, and I just feel like, cause I was like, what am I gonna read tonight? And I, I started reading, and, the, and it's not because it's the first poem, but I feel like this first poem from this book, actually like you've spent the second book um, kind of unpacking this first poem in a way. And I also felt really like um, connected to this poem and I'll read poems from this poem, but I wanted to start out with uh, the first poem from Invisible Gifts by Manic D Press um, and it's called Home. The steps that lead to the front door are flecked with silver dust and shimmer when the sun is low in the sky. When the toilet flushes, it echoes four times. Mismatched mattresses, Egyptian king frame, a broken oven with a working stove, the piles of paper, the piles of clothes, the piles of files, Objects collected over years and years. The slippers from Ikea so guests won't scuff the floor. The house plants that manage to live with little water. The dust bunnies, the hairballs, the silk underwear, the bent spoons, the dented pillows, the dental floss. The boxes in the garage filled with old pictures, letters, and record albums from the 70s, wrapped candies, Moroccan mask, tea bags, plane tickets, hospital bills. In the office closet, the ceiling is moldy, dark spots expanding, too high to reach without a ladder. The paint on the balcony wall peels off in shapes of rabbits and deer. A cigarette butt floating in a yellow flower pot. The neighbor crosses the street. Why the recycled bins overflowing? Why the flow of strangers leaving with office chairs and toaster ovens? Why the missing husband, the dent in the car? Why the real estate agents in their well-fitted suits? Why the cracked driveway? Why the overgrown juniper? One fall, an old friend announced upon walking into the living room for the first time. I agree, the view is fantastic, but you're not supposed to live here. The hallway is a long corridor that leads to the front door. The doorknob is diamond shaped and needs to be jiggled and turned to the left to be opened. Such a beautiful poem. And, um, and of course, if you haven't gotten the second book, please do. I mean, it's so beautiful. Um, so from that poem, uh, I'm gonna just read five poems uh, from my book, Bodega. Three short ones and then two medium. I hope that's okay. Um, I'll go fast. 
The first is called Latchkeys. When headlights cast shadow puppets against the living room wall, my brother and I did our best to keep up appearances. He'd scurry to turn off the Nintendo console while I hung up on my best friend. He splayed open his biology textbook. I leapt to the upright Yamaha to play the first few notes of Furelise. A perfectly choreographed intermezzo for our parents who'd stagger in from their hour long commute, their clothes reeking of chemicals. They'd nod, father heading straight to the backyard to hit a golf ball on a string while mother silently made dinner, rice, kimchi, spam. As we three listened from different corners of the house to a tiny white ball greeting iron. Next poem is called Amma. She packed a suitcase, not an immigrant bag the size of refrigerators, but for a quick getaway. Stuffing clothes into its slit maw, she tugged at the zipper as if she were pinching homemade dumplings. Please, please, begging like spoiled dogs. My brother and I cried for her to stay. She corralled us inside, muting our sighs, turned to say this was for the best. We would be okay. Saranghe. We cringed. We were not the kind of family that said, I love you out loud. She reminded me to set the timer on the rice cooker, then got in her Ford tempo, drove away. By dinner, she was back making kimchi jjigae. They rode into the night. Nothing had changed. Next time she packed a duffel bag, my brother and I stood as lookout, told her, to never return. We would be fine. This was for the best. But she must not have been listening. Corner store still life. Behind rainbow skittles, Marlboros, whatchamacallits, a recessed figure pines. Her profile scored by fluorescence like a knockoff Vermeer. Just as antique coins are painstakingly preserved, she is rendered motionless, box in, days endless, hubbub of vestive streets beyond tchotchkes and plexiglass, ricochets off walls exalting the departed, framed first dollar bill, photos of random strangers jaundiced with soot and wear, she a generation without proof of birth, not a single memento containing any modicum of mirth. Holding her tongue with a fury untouched, a solitude so great, she remains mighty in anonymity, tangrams of daily trade. Can anyone truly inhabit another? How meat of the body must be seized then cleaved laid bare to be wolf down whole as it's done in the wild. So I have two more poems. I hope that's okay. Um, thank you again, Ma and Natalie. Congratulations and City Lights and Marcello. So great to read with you tonight. Uh, the second to last poem is called Face Off. And I don't think I've ever read this out loud before, but Face Off. After a few nomadic years, we settled into a split level house, nestled in a cul-de-sac, away from bustling burrows, but never far from rates of sprawling estates and train tracks that cleaved privilege and affluence from our constant state of deprivation. A latchkey kid, I often stole away to the basement, chock full of vinyl, ba vinyl bags of worn clothes and box skyscrapers reeking mothballs. My mother, an expert magpie of things already discarded. Built-in bar next to the boiler, 
deserted and unused, became Barbie's mansion. Multi-storied cross-sections of elaborate chambers rivaling any store-bought imitations. Unlike my classmates' dolls, who had entire Mattel playrooms filled with glittery toys and miniature Pepto-Pink Corvettes, my Barbie only owned one other casual outfit. So I made sure Ken engaged in easy conversation, half lying on a couch made from fabric swatches, mimicking what I saw on the young and the restless. In the throat of this hidden cave, I inhabited whiteness without retribution. No longer a Ching Chong China girl, I a ravishing blonde trophy with perfect proportions. Pipe dream. I wondered what it would be like to strip away slit eyes, sick of assimilation, the debilitating task of tireless reinvention. Then came the right solution, press curling iron to sculpt a familiar countenance, black magic marker graffitied, graffitied over golden tresses. In horrific absolution, I beheld plastic melting into a gooey mess. Oh, the glorious stink of burning rubber. Without pomp or ballyhoo, I buried her in the backyard by a stand of evergreens, Ken thrown in for good measure, a pine cone in lieu of a headstone to lie in peace forever. My last poem, thank you so much, thank you. Uh, it's called Price, The Price of Rice. <clears throat> Grain to water ratio must be precise or the result will be catastrophe. I let my mother speak in hyperbole, concessions you allow someone who survived civil war, someone whose father was taken by silhouetted men in the dagger of night, someone who's toiled since the age of 10 someone who still eats last at the dinner table. Too much liquid, she tells me, you get porridge, jook, which sounds eerily similar to gook. The ways we must survive mortal moral combat. When I come down with a cold, she'd prepare my favorite remedy, congee, dashes of soy sauce and sesame oil, garnished with finely, finely chopped scallions simple, filling, an entire meal that fed a mother and her mother fleeing with three daughters and the eldest son now estranged. How a fistful of rice boiled down with extra water, satisfied rumbling bellies amid rubble mountains, ghost artillery, the peninsula cut in half by outsiders, then left to spar for eternity. One blind, one cursed, existential, consequential. My mother wistfully recalls what remains, memory broken by age and the willing as I drown my iPhone in a satchel of abundance. How I used to play, spreading its stickiness on loose leaf paper as glue, constructing hats to pretend I was a nurse mending wounds or a famous chef summoning feasts. When I first asked how to prepare the perfect heap of cooked rice, she casually filled the pot, placed her hand on top as if she were performing sacrament or taking my temperature, letting the water crawl between knuckles and wrist, eyeballing it. But I wanted exactitude, a basic math. She used to tease when I had a kernel stuck on my cheek or held hostage by my hair, saving it for later. I've never saved anything in my life when that's all she's ever known, using her body to carry and shield, cushioning me from every possible blow, taking it, taking it. So I'd never have to be intimately acquainted with the same country of hunger, polishing each 
granule clean with spit for a salvation for a bit of salvation a pearl thank you sue huang everybody such beautiful words um thank you peter our next <laughs> thank you for being with us our next reader for the evening is marcella hernandez castillo uh, he is no stranger to City Lights. We have hosted him in our halls before. Really greatly honored to have him with us again tonight. He's the author of Cezontle, a winner of numerous awards. His most recent book is the critically acclaimed Children of the Land, published by HarperCollins. As one of the founders of the Undocu Poets campaign, he is a recipient of the Barnes & Noble Writers for Writers Award. His work has appeared or has been featured in the New York Times, the Paris Review, People Magazine, the PBS NewsHour, amongst other outlets. Uh, he makes his home in Marysville, California, where he teaches poetry to incarcerated youth and also teaches at the Ashland University Low Res MFA program. Welcome. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you, Sue, so much for those beautiful, beautiful poems. Um, yeah, I, I, wrote, I, was, I was writing down some lines as you were reading. Um, I would love to talk to you about them later. Congratulations, Ma, congratulations, uh, Natalie, on both of your um, uh, books, um, having them here in the world. I can't wait to get my hands on them. Um, yeah, and I actually, I, I was actually gonna do the same thing. Uh, uh, I was gonna read a, a poem, but I, I'm packing to move, so I don't have anything packed um, anymore. I don't have anything else out. Um, but here's to say it's a, it was a tribute to Ma. Um, I'm glad to be reading with you again, and I'm excited to be reading with you for the first time, Natalie. I'm just gonna read a short piece from uh, my memoir. Um, and uh, first, can, can, can you hear me okay? Is my volume okay? All right, great. So yeah, I'm just gonna read a, a short piece from here, so I don't wanna take up too much time. I wanna give uh, Ma and Natalie um, the, the time for their books. Um, it starts off with a, it's, it's, this chapter starts off with um, a quote by Wendy Zhu from her poem, um, Notes for an Opening. It goes, I am trying to dissect the moment of my erasure. One, I never knew where my grandfather Jesus was buried only that he's been lying somewhere in the desert of Sonora for the last 60 years or so. Our family thought he was buried somewhere in a town called Empalme. We are almost sure he got a proper Catholic burial, but there was nothing proper about it. Six miles above the earth, my with my wife Ruby, 20 year absence, I looked out the window at the desert below to see what my grandfather couldn't see six decades before. How, despite its seeming endlessness, the landscape did have limits. It did have an end. From the sky, anything seemed possible. We were in the space between two countries, along that indiscriminate line where Perhaps even time was irrelevant. In the sky, I could stand still, something I couldn't normally do back home, something no one in my family was ever able to do, stand still. We were traveling from the Midwest to see my father for the first time in 10 years since he was deported in Mex to Mexico. It was 2013 and I thought I was still young enough to want to start things over between us. Flying thousands of feet above the border, I felt fluid. I positioned myself against powers larger than me. Abba could not and did not return to the US after his 2003 deportation. My mother had warned him not to test his luck by continuing to go back and forth under precarious conditions, but he wouldn't listen and he ended up paying, for a price, paying the price for it. I had just received DACA and applied for an advanced parole permit, which allowed recipients a special pass to leave the country and be allowed 
to legally return only under extraordinary circumstances in the face of an emergency. Abba had prostate surgery and I didn't know if this would be my only window of opportunity to see him. Simply not seeing a father for a decade would qualify as an emergency in any situation. On the plane, I wondered, oh two, on the plane, I wondered if there was an exact point when we were no longer in one country and inside another, or if there was ever a moment when I occupied no country. If ever that was possible, it was possible up in the air. There was no clear correlation between what was happening down below and up above. I had heard that at the official port of entry, there were turnstiles, just like in the subway, ushering the travelers forward. If such turnstiles existed, you could map the precise moment when half of your body was here and the other half was there. I could measure. All I wanted was that little gold stamp that said I clicked past onto the other side. I entered, I returned, I was measured, I was counted for, recorded. Would a sudden coldness come over us when our bodies moved over the actual line of the border? Wasn't that how loneliness began with the coldness of our bodies? Three, when I developed black photographs in my high school art class, I erased all the grayness from the resolution because I believed you didn't need gradients to understand an image. I believed in black and white. I won an award because even though I deformed the images beyond recognition, people could still see through them and understand them. I wanted someone to look at them and know what they were looking at despite everything I had done. Everything was either light or it was a tree. You were either in one country or you were in another. There was no in between black and white. I had no patience for gray. There was nothing I could do to stop the plane from charging forward. It felt like we were going too fast. I was afraid I would miss the moment we would officially cross over. The border existed both outside me as well as within. I smiled at the flight attendant who smiled back. I ate my wife's biscoff and I pressed my face to the window. Four. When I came undocumented to the US, I crossed into a threshold of invisibility. Every act of living became an act of trying to remain visible, negotiating a simultaneous absence and presence. Act of displacement. Again, I am trying that moment of my erasure. I tried to remain seen for those whom I desired to be seen by, and I want visible to everyone else. Or maybe I was trying to control who and who forgot, but I couldn't control what someone else saw in only persuade them that it was an illusion. There were things that I could not hide, things that would come out of me and expose me in moments. It was my skin, it was my hair, it was my cheek. The war would give me away. I was afraid of the way I walked. Easy to imagine being hit by a car because even if they didn't see me, I would for once be my body smoke. I had to self-deport to Mexico, and in the months leading up to her uh, departure, I moved back in with her to make the transition easier. So this is we're preparing for her to leave. Back in her house, I brushed my mother's hair, which was soft and thinning. 
she started dying in for the first time. Maybe that's why it felt so light through my fingers. She always loved her gray hairs, said it made her look refined, dignified, but not anymore. We sat on her couch late at night watching a Spanish dubbed Steven Seagal movie on Telemundo. Her arms were small and I could feel her sharp bones angled at the softest parts of her. I rubbed oil in her hair and kept brushing as we both laughed at Seagal, those quick action camera angles and the infamous ponytail whipping back and forth. The explosions in the background 20 years after the movie had been released seemed faded and uneventful as if by now in our dim rooms Telemundo version they were only pointing at fire but couldn't actually burn as if they were only saying bang but were muted and Segal knew this he was indifferent with his emotionless face perhaps already aware during filming of the dim and fuzzy filter he would be seen through 20 years later in a dark room where a boy who was hardly a boy anymore was brushing his mother's hair. It was as if he knew that his voice would be replaced by the voice of a man speaking in a heavy Castilian Spanish who had difficulty expressing surprise when a bomb exploded and which opening his mouth much to speak. She never had many knots in her hair, continued to brush. It wasn't defeat that was growing in the air with each week. It was exhaustion. It was easier to brush her hair than to tell her I would miss her. I knew she would never return. Could we be blamed? There was an abscess growing on her arm from a car accident. It looked like a golf ball on her wrist and it forced her to become left-handed. I remember her being mad at me as a teenager and saying, it didn't hurt when she hit me, but I had to pretend that it did. What hurt most was the fact that she hit me, the fact that she couldn't hit me with her right, the fact that she had to adjust her body side left and that I stood there unfazed angry that I the fact that it didn't hurt but I cried nonetheless if the lights were on in the room and if I were looking at Ama for the first time I would notice the remnants of accident the scars running down her neck and the one shoulder were small pieces were still tucked just beneath the skin and yet lodged too deep to extract. The largest ran down the length of her forearm where they opened her and replaced all the bones with metal. The metal would stay there, but the glass would not, at least not all of it. The doctor said that the shards would come out by themselves unexpectedly and years later with minimal pain, like a slow bullet traveling out of her, like a bullet in a film with an already outdated actor looking directly into the camera as he recites one offers like, I'm a bad motherfucker. I imagined the glass making its uneventful entrance into the world two decades later, as if it were alive squirming the way snakes do when they come out of the shell. Maybe it would be a lonely affair. No one there to see it except Ama, who would surely be confused at first, seeing something leave her body. Or maybe I would be there to witness this thing that's been part of my mother's body for so long that it could be mistaken for bone. I wouldn't know how to hold it if it fell in my hands. I would put it to my ear and listen. I would hold it to the light before giving it back to Ama so that she could know what it was that hurt her every time she lifted her arm to hit me. Thank you.
Thank you, Marcelo. Powerful, powerful words. Um, it's an honor to have you with us tonight. Uh, so next up is Natalie Konkan, uh, the second featured book of the evening. We're happy to have you with us tonight. She teaches Arabic language and literature in the Department of Near Eastern Studies at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, and she is the founding director of the Danish House in Palestine. Her work has previously appeared in the Berkeley Poetry Review, uh, Jubilat, and the Crab Creek Review. Uh, she makes her home in San Francisco with her husband and daughters. Uh, we are happy to be celebrating Quiet Orient Riot, published by Omnidon. Welcome. Thank you, Peter, so much. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction and City Lights for hosting. Thank you to Omnidon that I can now call a home. I'm, it's really an honor. And uh, it's a pleasure, Marcello, Ma, and Sue, to be reading in your company. And thank you to all these faces and names that I know and love. Um, so, um, oh, I also want to thank, I, I want to thank someone special who took this book of poems um, with him to read in Yosemite last weekend and got caught in a snowstorm while the rest of us were dancing in the streets of San Francisco. So now I know that the poems are snowproof. Thank you, Bassett. Um, just as the briefest of introductions before I begin reading, let me just say that uh, the poems take place in, in Israel, Palestine, and they do tell a kind of story. They tell a story about a journey, a slow journey into motherhood in Palestine um, a journey that went through fertility treatment in Israel and that also coincided with the 2009 military assault on Gaza. So it's a story about, uh, about motherhood, um, about technological maternity, about birth regimes, um, and about women's bodies, women's bodies as national vessels and all the ways that women's wombs um, become the site of so much contestation and anxiety. To say I once wrote an email to Mahmoud Darwish, I don't know if he saw about being newly arrived in the occupied territories before I knew to call it territory. The bread is flat in my hand and it's a flawless kilometer to a friend's house. A taxidermied giraffe in Kalkilia I haven't seen yet and a progressive progesterone protocol I haven't tried yet. And he's not yet a dead poet. To say I'm in a position on the brown sofa on the fifth floor in Beit de Shami and cold. I go between her saint's blue light and ringing towels of tepid water. Anticipate one land in that position on the sofa and that national question. When I'm done writing chapter four, the poet's dead. He's dead in Houston during a poet's heart's operation. Basil is away when news from Texas. Salim says everyone will be at Almanara Square. It's a literary history. It's a poet's funeral. It's a quiet orient riot. Set on these storied soils, don't spoil any seed. There is no pure race. A bride is still bridal. A checkpoint is still torn hill. In just a few weeks, topographical categories shift and our bodies move toward a lid with a tighter seal. With the hill gone, another concrete tower erupts and the militarized, sanitized. It's a border crossing running through continuous land. 
If I get married here, I will get stuck here and my wedding sob against the bodies of buses jamming here. If I bear a child, my engorged breasts here, the human count is a crucible. The way it sounds, it's May soon coming for dinner. She always says that we should stop holding our breath for justice. She says, enjoy the little justices instead. Those teeth of hers are monumental. I've always wanted an ambrosial smile and subtle glottal stops. From here, you may proceed straight and only look back once on the corner by Lambada video next to Kulshi Shahi, a young Arafat glints in the afternoon sun. In it, it feels like home and handsome patriotism. This is area A and the margins are utterly regrettable. We live in a city on a hill and it belongs to God and shuttered cinemas. Soil shimmer towards something grand, shattering in many parts, and cumin is pervasive. This is Ramallah, you see, and much shapes up and many are digging. We consume summer and habitable evenings. My ovaries have been in the hands of men on both sides. My sister skypes between children from the left land. My follicles are not yet purring. She says, of course nothing will happen to me. Now Hannah, she spoke in her heart. She said, master of the universe of all that you created and woman, you did not create anything for naught. Eyes with which to see, ears with which to hear, a nose with which to smell, a mouth with which to talk, hands with which to do work, feet with which to walk, and breasts with which to nurse. These breasts that you placed on my heart, what for? Not to nurse from them? Streets that narrow on the other hand, it's a pool of hips. This is a picture of three men standing up, coiling father, his hands empty and empty. There is no trace of saccharine in the teas of Gaza. There is nowhere safe to hide. Strident gets us through 21 days. We see raw and wrapped truncated winds. To say I see country with some war, although seabird populations can withstand the failure to produce young in one or even a few years without suffering severe population level consequences, the loss of adults has an immediate and long lasting impact on population dynamics. We meet and I see you. Your head piles in my lap like a geometric slap of gorgeous rock. The quarry slimming around us. Even a small decrease in adult survival rates may cause population decline. It's easy to wish away a winter of dying and processing disorders. I call Hadassah Fertility Clinic and the nurse flaunts the flag. Dr. O returns from, to Jerusalem from Gaza City in time to perform embryo transfer. It's a tide pool of white, eggs and phosphorus. I call Basil to deliver me out of imminent complicity and maternal possibility. Hamoud lost his toes bleeding. She fed him like a baby bird. Dandelion and concrete strings between Ramallah and Balagho. Someone loved is dying. It's a day 
and there's no rumor of its end. To say at the foot of stars, it's an operation of dust flailing and scentless. It's a kind of laughter. In a world of fewer babies, I can even begin to tell you how lucky we soon were. Crested child girl conceived inside two population biologies with reproductive rates. You can imagine us quantifying our fecundity. For seabirds, the aggregation of large portions of the adult population in colonies means that a single catastrophic event can kill a large segment of the local breeding population. You can imagine us contemplating factors that would influence nest survival. We take the carried and the kissed to be weighed 3,645 grams, and now she is counted. We swim in a sea of radiant participles. We don't want to give her laden names. We resist an ever quotable ending. To say we exist and die to introduce even a minimal change in the strength of the state. To say we reproduce in equal measure and not at the same time. Whether the proportion of Palestinians in the West Bank, whether Jews in Judea and Samaria, whether our replacement level grows, our handsome eulogy for the carried tiny throbs. Count this child girl, count her on this side. This is her first birth world. The capacity for happiness despite visual evidence is great. You have begun to worship what grows in the rubble. I dream of multiple sweet children in diffident t-shirts, count more than 20 impossibles. Ahmed and his friend ask for the very young child. They take her to the Islamic club next to that place where they sell baked eggs. A little justice. It's a world of boys and girls with noisy Nokias. She's the lifted held by a world. On the fifth floor, her eyes are closed now. Her hair thing is yellow. The radio is along. We are all equally close to the good place. We bathed you in a bucket more than once, child girl. That bucket was gray and black of handle and I will not forget. I come home every day and find someone who is clean. The way love takes you inside its slanted season. On the way out of me, you didn't make a sound. On the balcony facing Jerusalem, I hear your eyelashes grow. A little justice. I hear your eyelashes grow, bucket girl. I still struggle to make lines longer. Patience doesn't want to do its job with me right. They said it was morning. I translate a poem in Vatic light from Jericho. Say, stay human, says the wall. I loop like the smoke rolling still in your mouth. The street becomes a street that fills up with spring and sheep, curbs and carob trees. I stretch my right knee. At home, a new child waits along with blue eyes and hair. Where she is born is a fine thing, Scabiosa Palestina. I need to put a load in the washer. I don't always look up when you walk by. Collect it. Graft it, warm root. I feel possibly covered like a book drawn in that coffee shop for men. And then I feel right in every corner like a table. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. 
Very powerful words. Um, I'm going to take a moment to encourage everyone, please, please, please do buy a book tonight. Uh, it helps out Omnidon and City Lights. Uh, we're, we're not out of the woods as far as COVID. Uh, it's been uh, pretty rough sailing. Um, so if you do get a chance to, please do come down to the store, support us there. You can pop next door to Vesuvio's, as I said earlier, maybe grab a beer. So um, it helps. Thank you, folks. Uh, so our final reader for the evening is none other than Ma Xian Wen. Uh, Ma is very familiar to City Lights and is no stranger. She has graced our halls before. And um, we're really, really happy to be celebrating this book at this time. Um, Ma is the author of the poetry collection, Invisible Gifts, as well as the chapbooks, Ruins of a Glittering Palace and Score and Bone. Uh, so we're celebrating storage unit for the Spirit House. Uh, Ma has actually served as Poet Laureate of El Cerrito from 2016 to 2018. Uh, she is one of the great movers and shakers of Bay Area poetry. So again, really such a great honor to have you with us tonight, Ma. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks so much, Peter, and everyone at City Lights for hosting and to everyone for joining us tonight. And um, Sue and Marcello and Natalie, thank you for your um, beautiful readings. And I just want to say that I'm um, ever grateful to Rusty and Ken and all of the wonderful um, folks at Amidon. So I'm gonna share poems for my new book, um, Storage Unit for the Spirit House. And um, I just wanted to give a shout out to my friend, Adrian, uh, my best, one of my best friends, Adrian, who's artist on the cover and the drawings inside are by uh, my other best friend, Mark Dutcher, who's here tonight. Hi, Adrian and Mark. Um, so I'm going to share poems um, from my new book. Storage Unit 202. The rental faces another house. When she arrives, there are wild turkeys in the street. It begins to rain. The storage unit in El Cerrito holds pinned moths in cases. Brass castanets, tin pants, a box of cork buttons. She swims laps in the thunderstorm. Storage Unit 202. One, secondhand gloves. Two, a king drinking pear juice trapped in a glass jar. Three, wet hair and wet fur, four velvet spurs, five directions to the other world. Storage unit 202. I crawl into the pod formerly known as storage unit 202. Inside is a quilt made of yesterday's tablecloth, today's plaid coat, and tomorrow's prayer shawls. The storage unit emits a humming sound. Occasionally, a high-pitched note bounces off the metallic walls. I cook peas in the pod. I drink moonshine at dawn. Observations. One might sense a breath over a face. One may envision the tourists trampling the wildflower super bloom. One can sleep alone with a space heater. And this is called Theater in Four Acts. Empire of Sound. Stage abandoned, invisible construct. Luma and chroma spider webbed. Lake drop retina. Seabirds are fire flowers, sun totems, misensen. Blue light leaks through flecks of paint, a message or not. 
And this is um, theater in three acts. Where are the minnows? Song of gongs in mini mall. What happens to the body after soliloquy? Mine in mottled fur coat. When does the future arrive? Birthmark on forehead in shape of flame. And the title of this poem is Storage Unit for the Spirit House. The father at dining room table, shades drawn, wobbly thrown. The daughters with their brown shaky hands. A forest snat haunts the master closet among the clothes moths, felt wolverines. Daughter number one, hiding behind a juniper bush, bright longies, wooden handgun in metal case. Daughter number two, sleeps with a long broom next to her bed, mint chocolates under pillow. 5 a.m., the father drops a cold wet towel on her face. Storage unit filled with boxes of LPs, Joni, Dylan, Carly. Back cover of Jimi Hendrix experience. On two hits of acid, this will blow your brains out. Dusty military jackets, punishment belt, piles of lock boxes, missing keys, jars of Nescafe, VHS tapes of Burmese pop singers. Daughter number three listens to father's records in the den, altered music room, sits on the piano bench near the door, the father in armchair, Joni singing a case of you. Forest snap flutters above in air Smoky from Kent 100s. And uh, my book is dedicated to my mother, Aya Gunasari, and this poem is for her. Water Space One. Tree mouth of river. Sculpted ether. In Kent. Branch lip of sky, mother trapped in a tree. Water space two, blood hyacinth, evidence of a past event, childhood, a burning kingdom, slap, clap, pearled lantern, bruised hands clung to rowboat. Water space three, filled the bathtub with warm water, added amber egg dye, marigolds, baptized each other into the drunken night, slept in a swimming pool, rendered in raindrops. Sipped lemonade in winter, whiskey in spring. Flooded temple, missing guru. Child sandal floating in the backwaters of Kerala. Gone towns. And this next piece was published in the anthology Colossus Home. Halls, children not sleeping, cement floors, mylar sheets, small bodies turn, held, sorrows collected, panopticon, held in cells, how do they hold? 
the halls get cold. The children are not sleeping. Containers. What about the spitting cobra? Why do I repeat myself? Does self storage matter? Are your teeth still here? Who do you hold? Is this a panic attack? When did the cormorants arrive? Where does guilt come from? Do you see the Calathea? What disturbs me? I witness each body through the missing bricks. Den. In the den, he would say, just keep your big mouth shut. And we did, standing in a line along the wall. I have taught you many things. At the conference, I said I was God. Mother would say, someday you'll meet your older sisters. Pray to Buddha, pour water in this bowl. She worked like a dog, like a dog. She loved him the most. I don't wanna leave you without a father. Your aunt's favorite color is blue. Should sprinkle curry powder on our mac and cheese. I'll stay with him until your sister gets married. And this is called MRI scan. Band marches through the crowd, chimes gong. A sound bridge vibration of metal coils. There were drummers and wailing, promise of salvation, malediction, but no misfortune. There were seekers and preachers, panic button, bang, bang, last sensation. And I'd like to read a couple of Spirit House poems. This is called Spirit House Four. Sibling follows sibling into thorn forest. Girl holds stick of incense, tip a glow. 37 gnats await atop Mount Popa. Volcanic relics, sister brother, blue-throated barbets, lightning clue, nest lands on soft earth, entwined vines, distant blaze, candle wick floating in bowl of oil. Spirit House Five. As a child, I did not climb trees. Instead, I gathered leaves that flew to the ground. The elms were tall in the fall, the neighbor boys cruel. One left a dead kitten in a box on the doorstep. I made homes among the leaves, safety in gold, yellow, brown invented a family who lived in a tree house. Green twig, the mother, broken branch, the father, two ferns, the missing sisters. Thank you. And this poem was published today in the racket and it's called Convention Center. Miniature show dogs, with bejeweled collars and tricked up vests. Sometimes their tails get caught in the swinging hoops, causing grief 
and regret. I growl to my brother over the phone, how I miss the loving barks of our childhood. And this is my final poem and it's called Spirit House Six. And it's the final poem in my book as well. Spirit House Six. The gnats had moved into the house on Inya Lake, zoomed through halls with pocket knives, tamarind seeds, green bananas, family offerings of jade bracelets, cheroot cigars, deer tails. The medium danced wildly in the living room, drunk on palm wine, spinning, spinning. Orchestra of circle drums and copper bells played on the staircase, not quay. Eight children on the floorboards, leaping over uncles and cousins, shaking, shaking. Mother lit candles on the wall shrine. She spoke to the blue winged insects. They whispered back. A gnat warmed itself by the flame. Auntie walked in a dream state, hot room. Cousin slowly opened a large trunk of teak and silver strips. The gnats flew inside, one after the other, after the other. Thanks so much for joining tonight. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ma. That was really beautiful. I'm going to open it up now to the other readers just to have kind of a final word. Um, I always feel strange, like just sort of ending it, because these things end so abruptly. So I just kind of think it might be nice just to create a ritual where we just sort of Everyone who's had a chance to speak just says something. One last final word. Sue, Marcello, Natalie. I just want to say congratulations to Natalie and Ma. Yay! <laughs> Book launch. Woo! Amazing. Congratulations. And I'll echo that just by saying congratulations as well. You're both. Both of your work is absolutely beautiful. Thank you for that. Aww. Thank you, Marcello. And thank you, Sue. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Natalie. Congratulations. And um, I'm just so happy to see so many faces tonight. I'm just thrilled and um, and just so grateful to Omnidon to have a new book out and celebrate with everyone tonight. And, um, and if you're free on Friday at noon, um, I'm doing an event at UC Berkeley that's um, sponsored by the Center for South, Southeast Asian Studies and it's at noon um, from 12 to one. So please join and um, thank you again for coming tonight. <laughs>